Hi, I'm Mitch Gallagher from Sweetwater. Welcome to a very special live stream. Today we'll be joined by legendary bassist, composer, producer Marcus Miller. Marcus's resume reaches back decades and covers so many great artists and incredible projects. We'll be talking about groove, we'll be talking about how to work in a session, how to be a better bass player, how to be a better producer, gear, tone, lots more. Let's tune in and talk to Marcus right now. What's happening, man? How are you doing? Can you I, hear me okay? I can hear you just fine. Yeah, yeah. So, man, let's let's jump right in. I know uh, uh, they don't want to hear me talking. They want to hear you talking. So let's uh, so let's get right into it. Uh, let's let's talk a little bit about how you got into playing bass and how you developed as a bass player because you actually started as a classical clarinet player, right? Yeah, you know, my dad's uh, he played the organ and the piano. So um, and his family is very musical. So I was around music all the time. Um, you know, I think I started probably just copying my dad on the piano. You know, if you if you can figure out that if you just play the black notes and whatever you play sounds cool. So I think my first composition was just like all, you know, pentatonic black notes. Right. But then, uh, like, uh, I think in fourth grade in the New York public schools, they offered you the recorder, which is that little wooden instrument, wind instrument. And then uh, a year later, uh, the clarinet. I started on the clarinet, and just because I love music, I mean, clarinet wasn't my first choice. It was the trumpet they offered, they offered the clarinet, and they offered the drums. So, of course, I wanted to play the drums, you know, but we lived in an apartment. My dad was like, oh, no way. You're going to be banging on the drums in the, in the small apartment. So uh, he said something soft like a clarinet. Right. <laughs> so anyway, I started playing the clarinet. It's cool because a year later, uh, I had a great music teacher named Mr. Guarino, in middle school and he moved me uh, or at least he had me add the saxophone to that so that was cool you know but then I heard you know R&B music man I started getting heavy into it James Brown uh, Sly and the Family Stone and the Jackson 5 all the Motown stuff and I started feeling like I wanted to be more in the center of the music more like you know like wanted to play something more critical you know and uh, a friend of mine got a bass for his birthday who lived in the same building as me in Jamaica, Queens. And uh, I probably uh, got on his family's nerves because I think I was over there playing that bass more than he was. And, uh, but I just connected with it. And uh, it felt like it was really at the core of music, especially I'm talking about the 70s. So, man, you know what the 70s music sounded like. Like the drums in the 70s, the bass drum was just like a knock. You know right. what I mean? Because they didn't have the whole, every drum on a different track in the mix studio. They put a mic... <laughs> They put a mic above the drum set, you know what I mean? So the bass drum sounded like a knock, and the bass guitar carried all those Motown songs. It carried the whole bottom of the record, right? So um, I think I was drawn to that. You know, Isaac Hayes, uh, and then later on in the 70s, there was a bunch of funk bands like Cool and the Gang and Mandrill and War and all these bands, and the bass was just always there, man. So I just fell in love with the bass. I never stopped with the clarinet. You know, that was the instrument I played, like, to get my formal music education. But the bass, man, I just fell in love, you know. Had to prove myself on the bass because, you know, back in the 70s, all the bass players, they were really tall and big, you know what I mean? Because they were like holdovers from upright players, you know. Right. And so they were like, man, you more of a sax player. You know, they look at you and decide what instrument you should be playing, you know what I mean? But uh, so I had, to, I had to kind of be a little insistent and... Uh, you know, insist that they let me try it on the bass. Eventually, it was cool. Right, right. So let's let's talk a little bit about uh, your approach to bass. If if, if uh, let's think about it this way. So you're classically trained on clarinet. That would give you the melodic kind of component. There's also the uh, the groove component. There's the tone component, and there's the technique component. So we've kind of got four things as bass players that need to be developed. Can you talk a little bit about how you developed those four aspects of bass playing? Yeah, um, the first thing was just um, playing, uh, being able to hear the bass line on records because not everybody can do that. You know, like if you talk to somebody and you tell them to play the bass, they go, well, which one is the bass, you know? But first, you know, you learn to hear it and you learn what it does, you know? And then you, um, you're just learning the notes. you learn the notes. And then you do your first talent show, right? And... All of your boys say, man, I couldn't understand the note you were playing. And you don't know what happened. You know, you had a nice, warm sound that sounded good in your bedroom. 
Why? Why? How come no one could, could understand what I'm playing? And then an older guy would say to you, man, listen, you got to learn about your tone controls. You got to add treble. Even though it's a bass guitar, you got to add some treble so people can hear where one note begins and one note ends and all that stuff. So you start focusing in on tone, you know. And uh, like you said, playing the horns and the piano also, because I always stay with the piano too because of my pops, you know. So you start transferring all that knowledge to the bass, you know. So I, I, um, I think I was fortunate because, you know, playing the clarinet, playing the piano, I understood the whole picture of music. You know, a lot of bass players, they're just kind of living in the basement and they don't really understand everything that's going on above them. But for me, that was, um, that, that came with the other instruments that I played. Now, um, you know, when I first started playing, the first stuff I started playing was 70s bass lines. So you had bass lines that went like... Isaac Hayes Shaft, you know? You had... So you had you had uh, bass lines like that where you really, and I wasn't playing like that. I was playing like finger style. So you started getting that man, and then all of a sudden I heard Larry Graham, and Larry was like, and we were like everybody, all the bass player was, what is that? What is he doing? And I was like, okay, I gotta learn how to do that. What is he doing? You know, it turns out his drummer had quit when he had an organ player, an uh, organ trio with his mom. And he was, you know, he was actually a guitar player. He was playing the bass because first the bass pedals on the organ broke, and then the, then the drummer quit. So he, he rented a bass, right? This is what he what he says. He rented a bass, and um, and then the drummer wasn't there. So he said, well, I gotta make make some rhythm. So he started thumping and pl plucking the bass and. He created that thing. Upright players have been doing similar stuff, but I think he was the first one who really did it on a bass guitar. You know. Anyway, I got heavy in the gram, and then I heard Stanley Clark, and he blew my mind. You know, in terms of his tone and his technique, and then Jaco Pastorius. You know, and then there were groove guys like Paul Jackson, who played with Herbie Hancock and the Headhunters, James Jamerson. You know, and so um, you know you playing. You know what I mean? You're playing. So all that stuff started coming together for me. You know what I mean? Uh, I um, started playing fusion, right? That was in the 70s. And because of fusion, it's exactly what they say. All these styles were fusing together, you know what I mean? So they'd have a rock guitar player, they'd have a jazz drummer, they'd have a funk bass player, you know what I mean? Or some kind of combination. So you could choose what elements you wanted to, to combine. So, you know, I started combining, like I was playing, um, you know, jazz, because I was getting into that. I was playing like, um, with Larry Graham. started taking all of your different influences and just starting to put them in a blender, you know what I mean? Um, so I was getting into that fusion and then I got, um, started meeting some incredible people. I started playing with Roberta Flack, um, who, who was just an incredible singer and what she was really incredible at was space, you know what I mean? So I'm coming from fusion where we're going, you know, we're going, You 
You're playing all that stuff, and then all of a sudden you're in Roberta Flack's band, and she's going, first time ever I saw your face. And you're learning how important that is to just play the right notes. I felt the moon and the stars. Nothing else. Play exactly what you need. And think about, like, if you're not playing a lot of notes, what's the most important thing? Your tone, right? You have to support the whole band. You, don't, you can't get away with playing a lot of notes. There's a lot of um, musicians who are playing a lot of stuff, but their sound, they don't really have that together because they skipped that stage, right? And uh, Wayne Shorter told me, your tone is your delivery mechanism. Nobody will really focus on what you're playing if your tone isn't correct. So I started really focusing on that. I found myself in Roberta Flack's band. I met Luther Vandross. And Roberta's band, we started working together. We played on his first demo, which became Never Too Much. Mm. Uh. So Luther had, you know, like funky R&B jams like that, but he also had beautiful ballads and I got to use the lessons I had learned with Roberta Flack. Luther was in Roberta's band also, by the way. I got to learn those lessons, you know, use those lessons with Luther. I got to use those lessons with Grover Washington Jr., George's cousin, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I got to use those lessons on space and tone. Um, I was playing a Fender jazz bass with round, wound strings, you know, fusion coming out of Stanley Clark and all that stuff, but I found myself in a lot of situations where I needed a more round sound to support these incredible R&B singers I was playing with, right? Um, I'll never forget, man, there's a guitar player named Eric Gale. Eric Gale is an incredible guitarist. Eric played with Aretha Franklin. He played with Grover Washington Jr. He played on thousands of records. And um, everybody recognizes him as a guitar player. If you ever heard Grover Washington Jr.'s Mr. Magic, then you've heard Eric Gale, because he was the guitar player who played that incredible stuff. But Eric doubled on the bass. Every once in a while, people would hire him to play the bass. And he had this old bass, and he had never changed the strings probably since he bought it, you know what I mean? And he was playing, the strings were all dead. At, <laughs> and I remember a producer, a great producer, Ralph McDonald, I, I walked into a studio once to say hi, and Eric was playing bass, and I'm going, why is this guy, why does he have him playing bass, you know? And Ralph said, I haven't played bass because that's what a real bass sounds like. You know what I mean? <laughs> he said, can you play like that? You know, I'm like 18. I'm like, yeah, of course I can play that. So I started, you know, goofing around going. And, and next time Ralph used me on a session, I played like that, and he loved it. He was like, man, that's a real bass. You know, so basically... You know, the old Fender basses, they had flat wound strings. They had a pickup cover like this here. Can you see? Yeah. And they also had a pickup cover here, right? And underneath this pickup cover was a piece of foam that sat right on the strings. And that's why you had that thump, that... that So I started fooling around with that with Ralph, found out it worked perfectly for Luther Vandross's records. You know what I mean? Because it was just the sound was fat and it, um, it supported the whole band. And because I wasn't locked into that sound, if I ever needed to jump out and play something and then jump back in, I could do it. So I got into this muted thing where I was just uh, <laughs> laying my hands on the strings, you know, and just... Uh, I was like, <laughs> right? So it really became a part of my thing. I mean, not everybody, like, you know, bass players are not going to be tuned into, wow, that's really cool. But the records sounded great, you know? And so 
that became part of my sound. And I was always, because of my fusion background, I was always still playing jazz. And that was about pushing the envelope in terms of your technique, especially as a bass player, you know what I mean? So I got into it all. And um, I ended up doing session work for like, I don't know, 20 years, you know? And a lot of people, they say, well, yeah, we know Marcus is sound. And there's a lot of records that have that sound, you know what I mean? That, you know, um, Okay, yeah, but as many records as I played on where you heard that recognizable sound, I played on Mariah Carey's first hit, you know what I mean? I played on Whitney Houston's first album, played on Elton John, Carly Simon, where you would never know it's me because I just played what was necessary and what was necessary was not, you know, jumping out there like that. So, um, so that was it, that was, those are four components. Of course, rhythm most important thing. And when you do studio work, you know, you got headphones on. People are listening to what you're doing with a microscope. So, you know, studio musicians learned about precision, you know. Lots of times, the people in the road band, the musicians in the road band couldn't figure out why whenever it's time for the singer to go into the studio to make a record, they'd never get the call. I've been touring with this person for six months but when she goes to the studio, she uses these, you know, these studio cats, you know. But the thing was that if you play only live and you're not playing and really focused in on what you're doing, tone-wise and rhythmically, right, uh, there might be something you're missing. You know, when you play live, you can get away with energy. You can get away with just, just your, your passion. You play in the studio, you gotta have that, but you also, you also have to have your tone, your intonation, all the stuff that, that gets exposed in the studio. So, um, you know, of course, with studio musicians, sometimes they lose that fire because they're, the, they're not out there on the stage every night, you know. So you try to keep both of those things going on. But that was, um, you know, in New York when I was coming up, I'm talking about the end of the 70s through the 80s into the 90s. Man, Will Lee, he's on probably a thousand records. Anthony Jackson, okay, he, he was one of the top guys. There was a Neil Jason, Francisco Centeno, uh, maybe one or two others, but there weren't that many bass players who could play with that precision, with that tone, play musically creative, and also be able to read music. You know what I mean? That was a very rare com combination. So there was a lot of, um, bass players who couldn't figure out why they weren't getting called for the studio uh, gigs, including the live musicians on the road, but that, that was a rare combination. One of the things I wanted to ask you about is how you perceive groove, because that's such a vital component of playing bass and working with a drummer, working with a rhythm section, and driving things. And uh, for example, when I talk to a Bootsy Collins, he talks about the one. That's what he always aims at, is the one. Either land on it or don't land on it, one or the other. Uh, Divinity know Rocks. Where it is. <laughs> you know, so all, uh, every bass player perceives things slightly different. I'm curious how you approach groove. Um, first of all, there's like a, a, a hundred different ways to groove, right? I think the most important thing is consistency, like making sure once you start it, you hold it down, you keep it, you know? And the other thing is just um, um, have respect for it, right? A lot of musicians feel like, you know what, I'm gonna learn my technique, I'm gonna fool around with my pedals, get my sound together, but they don't pay attention to rhythm, you know? And they feel like it's just there. And I'm telling you, the people who do pay attention to rhythm, we can point out the guys who didn't put in the time with rhythm. We can point it out like after three notes. You go, oh, this is gonna be a long night. You know what I mean? Um, and some of it comes from culture. You know what I mean? If you come from a culture where dancing was important, you know what I mean? Where if you come from a culture where your parents always, you always saw your parents dancing, you know what I mean? Where um, rhythm was part of everyday life, it comes a little bit more naturally, you know what I mean? Whereas if you have to start focusing on rhythm when you're 16, 17 years old, 
you're gonna have to really work at it. You know what I mean? But um, you can work at it. And um, for me, as a studio guy, I had to learn. I had to learn about drummers. I had to learn this drummer. He plays it this way, and I'm talking about the exact same beat. Dun, tap, da, dun, tap, dun, tap, da, dun, tap. With a hundred different drummers, they'll play it a hundred different ways. Each one has a different place where they put their sixteenth notes, and you start breaking it down. And you know, so when you get on a record date and you go, "Oh, this is this guy on drums." Okay, let me recalibrate. You know what I mean, so that I can make sure I can lock in with him. You know, locking in is very important. Um, on the records, some of the records that I did, I wanted to make sure I had a direct sight line to the drummer's foot. You know, I'd be like. I'm just watching his foot to see where he's, where, or I watch his hi-hat, you know what I mean, to see. But some grooves, especially with Luther Vandross, the hi-hat wasn't doing eight notes, so six eight notes, it was doing quarters. So jumps going, t -t 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 -t. so there's nothing in between, so you gotta find it somewhere else, right? So I'd be like, watching his foot. Woo. And uh, it's, a, it's an art, you know what I mean? And you start to, to figure out. You start to figure out this rhythm section and this particular song, I think I need to be the one to propel the groove, right? Other situations you go, you know the piano player is the one who has the groove. I need to just lock in with him, you know? So every, every song, every group has their rhythmic leader, you know what I mean? But you really gotta, um, you gotta approach it with humility, with humility. Um, a lot of um, people hear a certain style of music, like Latin or reggae or uh, R&B. They say, yeah, it's easy, and, I, and, and I'm going, none of these grooves are easy. If you think it's easy, that means you're not looking deep enough. You know what I mean? It might seem like it's easy because there's not a lot of notes involved, but if there's not a lot of notes, that means the feeling is probably even more important, you know? So you really need to focus. And I was, you know, like a student, and still am, you know, of that stuff. Just how, what makes this music groove? What makes it work? Wow, listen to, listen to the guy who's playing the kibasa. He's behind everybody else, right? He's playing slightly behind the beat, but it makes it, it, that's what makes it feel the way it does, you know? And I've been all over the world now, man. I've been in North Africa, I've been in the Caribbean, I've been in Asia, and I'm just watching how everybody grooves, man. And it's, uh, so there's no one thing, you know, some people tell you what you have to do is you have to do it like this. Um, you know, people who really understand it recognize Every genre has its own way to groove. You know, if you're playing straight ahead jazz, there's a way to groove. Even if you're playing straight ahead jazz, there's different ways to swing. Ray Brown had a certain swing on the bass. And Paul Chambers had a different swing. Sam Jones, these are my favorite guys, you know. But they all put the bass in a different part of the beat. I'm really big on where the bass falls in the beat. Does it fall right on the beat? If you're playing, if you're playing James Brown like Bootsy, you can fall right on that one. <laughs> wait, wait, I got a loop. Do I have a loop? Is my loop on? Hold on. Here's one music.
<laughs> That's the one. Now, if you're a bass player and you play some fancy lick and you miss that one, you're most likely gonna get fired, right? Ah, uh, you missed it. You're fired. Bootsy was like, man, you better hit that one, Marcus. <laughs> <laughs> That's Don't miss awesome. It. Let's jump to a question that came in over social media. This came in from Kevin Croston, and he asks, what is it as a professional musician who's been in the business for a lot of years that you still find challenging or difficult? Um, the grooves keep changing, like every 10 years. You know, the sounds keep changing. You know, um, like uh, 10 years ago, you know, what was happening, the, the, the rhythm of the street, the rhythm of the people was one way 15, 20 years ago. Now it's somewhere else, you know, and I just like to stay current with it and figure out how I can, how I can um, interface with it. It's not like I want to change and just be hip with every new thing, but I want to know what's going on and what I can take from it, you know, like, the sound that I'm playing with is basically from the 70s, <laughs> you know what I mean? But I found a way to alter it, you know what I mean, and make it work, you know, add some things, pull some things out, more space, more a different feel, get behind the beat, you know what I mean? So these kind of things are important. So that's the challenge for me, you know what I mean? It's just kind of continuing to evolve and keeping your ears open. Right. How do you stay excited about it? I mean, you've done so much and you've worked in so many, uh, so many different arenas on amazing projects. How do you stay excited day to day about music? Man, you know, my father played, his cousin played, my father's cousin played with Miles, played piano with Miles back in the 60s. I told somebody, it's like, you get tired of waking up in the morning? <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's like, this is, I mean, man, you know, so many people who, who would, who would be so, feel so blessed to be able to make music for a living, you know what I mean? So for me, I'm not one of those guys who takes anything for granted, man, you know? My kids will tell you, I make them, I used to make them watch the, the, the sunrise or, or watch the mountains, you know what I mean? Take a look at that, don't forget that, you know, appreciate that every time you see it. So, you know, just the, the, just the opportunity to play is a, is a blessing. Right, right. Let's go to another social media question. Cody Cox asks, what piece of music gear would you say has been most beneficial to you during your career? Uh, this right here, the bass, you know what I mean? <laughs> uh, that's the first thing. And, you know, we were talking, like when we, when we did the ads for this little thing that we're doing, we talked about getting the, the great bass sound, you know, and uh, in the studio. And one thing I was, I was saying that as a producer, I got to sit with a lot of engineers and see what they do to my bass, you know what I mean? So my job was to play with the right sound for the song, you know, so whether it's a... Or... Or, you know, or... Or... or play on a, on a record, particularly on, on recordings to play is consistently with a good tone and full sound, 
and, and a groove, right? But then I'd be in the studio with the engineer, I'd see him go like this. First thing he would always do, uh, especially for records where they needed a consistent bass sound at the bottom of the record, something to really support the music, they'd use a compressor, right? They put a DBX 160, which was an uh, old school compressor that's still fantastic now, you know, and that would, that would even out your notes. So what a compressor does, it basically, imagine your, your bass sound is a, a water balloon, you know what I mean? The compressor just goes like that and makes the notes last longer because when you go like this, that energy has to go somewhere, so it goes like that. So when you hold a note, it lasts longer. And so engineer, I said, are you putting a lot of compression? He said, no, I'm just putting enough just to, to, to smooth it out a little bit. So I would say a compressor. Um, I have a, a, a preamp, you know, that... Um, I have a, a, a preamp that here I, I was playing I was playing the um, the bass like passively but listen to the sound right that's what people know me for so it uh Gives you a little bit extra highs, a little bit extra lows, and effectively that makes it sound like you're cutting out the mids. You know what I mean? So I think that has a lot to do with my sound committing to that, you know, using that sound. Like a lot of bass players, they go, well, I'm going to use this EQ for this, for this song or this bass for this song. I committed to using one bass, and I committed to that sound, that kind of slightly scooped sound, and I think that had a lot to do with... with um, with my sound, you know. Mm. So let me ask you this. What are you working on these days? Are you practicing? Are you composing? Or what are you doing musically? Everything, man. You know, um, I like when my computer crashes because I'm, you know, producing and, and composing. And when my computer crashes, that's my excuse to start practicing. Until <laughs> so I, I used to practice a lot more when it was like OS 8, <laughs> when, the, when the computer was crashing every 30 minutes, you know. <laughs> now the computer's a lot more stable, so... I have to like actually find time to practice, but yeah, man, I'm I'm, um, I'm writing music for film, right? I'm uh, uh, producing some music for a fantastic artist named Jonathan Butler. We're working on something now. I'm writing music for myself, you know. So uh, I'm staying busy, you know. Right, right. Let's talk a little bit about producing. When you go in to produce with an artist, how do you approach that? Is there a Marcus Miller sound that the artist sort of wants you to provide them with, or are you looking at working with their sound? How do you, how do you look at that? So you just, you just, you just outlined the two, the two options, right? And they got some producers who basically, when you ask them to produce, because it's because you want them to put their sound on your thing, right? And then other producers are like, I'm gonna help you get the best version of your sound that I can, you know? And for me, it depends on who the artist is. You know, some artists, like when I was working with, um, with uh, Luther Vandross, he had a very clear idea of what he wanted his music to sound like. So for me, it was just like, help him get that sound. Be quiet, be humble, listen to what he talks about as his references, right? Listen to what he wants to achieve with his music and help him do that, you know? So lots of times, my value as a producer would be being able to communicate with the musicians. Say, hey, fellas, try it this way. Or that chord isn't right. You know, you know he'd say, something's wrong. I'd say, yeah, yeah, that's not a, a major chord, that third chord, it's, it's a minor, set, blah, blah, blah. You know what I mean? And you're just there to help facilitate and help them get the, the sound they want. Then other people, call, like when I did some stuff with Miles Davis, I brought a sound to Miles. You know what I mean? He said, hey, check this out. You know, it wasn't necessarily my sound, but when I heard there was an opportunity to write and produce music for him, I came up with this sound for him, which was basically, uh, I took every era of Miles that I knew, <laughs> right, from the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, and then added some more modern stuff, which was the 80s, that's when I was doing the stuff with him. You know what I mean? So, so sometimes I'll create a sound for them, sometimes I'll just help them get what, they, what they're hearing in their head. Right. And contrast that for us when you're the artist, whether you're working on a solo project or you're part of a group like SMV. So when, when, it's, when you're the solo artist, the hardest thing 
uh, is figuring out who you are and what the sound in your head is. And the reason it's hard is because if you spent 20 years being a studio musician, helping people, you know, do their thing, and you say, okay, for this record date, I got to be this guy, I got to be this bass player. For this record date, I got to be that bass player. You know what I mean? All of a sudden you say, okay, it's time for me to record, make a record. Wait, who am I? Which one of these 25 guys that I've been for the last 20 years, which one is the one I want to present as me? You know, and that, that took a minute. You know, I did a couple of records. I said, ah, you know what? Let me take a break. I don't think I found it yet. And then we started. After working with Miles, I think I was, uh, I felt like, okay, I think I know my sound, you know? So I, I chose a specific sound, you know, like that sound that I was just demonstrating to you, you know? Uh, you know, I, I started uh, using like a slap technique, but very um, subtle slap technique, not just, you know, you know, but trying to use it in a, a very musical way, you know, and I think that that gave me a window into what I can do as my, as an artist. Let me ask you a two-part question, and it's a question that I always ask when I have a great artist like yourself uh, here, whether in the studio or, or via Zoom or, or a live stream like this, and that is, what makes a great artist and what makes a great producer? A great artist is just someone who touches you. It might be they touch you with the quality of their voice. They might touch you with their, the, the message in their lyrics. They touch you with the sound of their instrument. Everybody does it a different way. It's usually a combination of all those things. But, um, you know, you got artists who are really technically incredible, like uh, Steve Vai or Oscar Peterson, George Benson, right? Then you got artists, singers who, like Bill Withers, who has a vocal range probably about that big, but will make you cry, you know what I mean, with what he's saying, because he has a really unique way, I'm sorry, I keep talking about him in the present, present tense, he had a very unique way of looking at life, and you could feel that through his music. So, um, you know, I think a great artist just finds a way to touch you. You know, sometimes it's with sophisticated tools, sometimes it's with simple tools, um, but that's what makes it incredible. Uh, it's that people find different ways to to touch you. Uh, as a great producer, I think a great producer is somebody who in the end, no matter what they have to do to get it, they come out with something that does the same thing, that touches people. Some producers play all the instruments on the record, write all the songs, and have to tell the singer or the, the instrumentalist exactly what notes to play, right? And then other producers just sit back and just listen and go, you know, I think... That third song you played is the one, you know what I mean? And I think that's something. But I think the key's a little too low for you. I want to hear you work a little harder, you know what I mean? That's what producers uh, do also. And some of the classic producers, I'm talking about Arif Martin, Tommy LaPuma, these are, these are guys who I work with a lot who were just beautiful observers and they would make a suggestion when they thought it was necessary. But no matter what you do, which way you do it, what you produce at the end is something that moves people. In the end, that's the most important thing. Right. Awesome. We've got time for one more question here. And this question comes from Joseph Patrick Moore. And Joseph asks, when you're mixing, typically what's on your bass chain? Do you do an amp and a, a direct bass? Are you parallel bus compressing? How do you approach mixing your bass sound? Um, first thing I do is make sure I got some good strings on the bass, right? Shout out to Dunlop. <laughs> there you go. Make sure, make sure that, uh, you know, uh, I have uh, a good sound coming out of the instrument. You know, because if you don't have a good sound coming out of the instrument, you can plug it into whatever you want. You're just kind of like, you know, you're, 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 you're polishing up a turd. You know what I mean? So uh, then uh, I go into a really high quality direct box, right, to bring my signal up to... Uh, to match what the, the mixing board needs. And um, it depends on the song. If it's a song that, uh, you know, for, for years, because I was a New York studio musician, everything was direct because we were doing three and four sessions a day. You know, you'd go, you'd play for, for two, three hours, you pack up, you go to the next studio, you do that like three or four times a day. And guitar players need an amp. They need to fool around with an amp because guitars don't always sound great direct. 
but with the bass, especially when I was doing it, you'd go direct. So your bass was really important, right? So I had a preamp on the bass to make sure I had a little bit more control because I was going direct. The engineer would put it in. He'd probably put a, um, a, a compressor on it. When I'm doing my records now, I use some compression. Sometimes I have an amp in the other room and mix the two sounds together, right? Uh, sometimes I'll uh, uh, double track the bass, you know what I mean? Um, uh, but it's pretty straight ahead, you know, and most of it comes from here, making sure I'm providing uh, a really solid sound f to, be, uh, to be manipulated, you know what I mean? Whew. Beautiful. Marcus, thank you so much for sitting down, doing this live stream, sharing your wisdom and your insights, man. It's been a real pleasure to see you. Man, thank you very much, man. Hope to see you again soon. Thanks so much for joining us here for this live stream with Marcus Miller. What an incredible pleasure to sit down with this legendary player, producer, and composer. The man has so much wisdom, so many insights, and we're so happy that you joined us here today. I'm Mitch Gallagher from Sweetwater.